But Cameron, how do you know that it wasn't placed there by a billion tiny aliens? Debunked. I think the only appropriate response to that kind of alternative is to just, uh... Why hello my fellow apes, welcome to my second rebuttal of Cameron Batuzzi's aka Capturing Christianity's Kalam. If you're not up to date already, then I highly recommend that you watch the previous exchanges here. But if you are up to date, then buckle in with a tea at the ready, for we have a lot to cover. We in fact have so much to cover that in respect of your time, I'm going to forego pleasantries and get straight to it. My plan here was to tackle each of Cameron's premises in turn, and then at the end extinguish a few of the many peripheral fires, but one such fire is so big that it threatens to burn down our exchange from the outset, and so I'm going to have to drown it now. At the beginning of his rebuttal, Cameron remarked dissatisfaction in the fact that I didn't argue that his premises are false, but merely that his justifications that he offered are flawed. Another general remark about Stephen's opening statement is that if you noticed, he didn't argue that either of my premises are false. Rather, what he did is he took aim at the justification that I offered in support of my two premises. Now I have to say, this is quite alarming, as it indicates that Cameron doesn't understand the burden of proof or the nature of debate. Cameron's role here is to present a valid argument and sound justification, and my role is to earnestly question his reasoning. My role is not to demonstrate that his premises are false, that's simply not how argumentation works. To offer an analogy, picture a scenario in which I present an argument for the existence of the Loch Ness Monster, and then when Cameron undercuts the justifications that I gave, I complain that he didn't attempt to prove that my premises are false. Just as it would not be his job to demonstrate the falsehood of my premises, so too it's not my job to demonstrate the falsehood of his premises. Now I'm sorry for addressing this before the argument, this is not the way in which I wanted to conduct myself, but as I hope you appreciate, I have no choice. It's absolutely vital that Cameron understands my role here. Okay, no more delay. As Cameron made clear in his opening, his argument for the existence of God consists of just two premises and a conclusion that take the form of modus ponens. Premise one, there is a first cause. Premise two, if there is a first cause, then God exists. And the conclusion follows, God exists. For the sake of continuity and clarity, let's take each premise at a time, beginning with his first. In his opening, Cameron offered one argument to substantiate his first premise, that being the Grim Reaper paradox. So here it is, here's the, here's the Grim Reaper paradox. He claimed that since the paradox produces a contradiction, thus we've arrived at an explicit contradiction, it follows that there cannot be an infinite number of Reapers. What's impossible about this story, about this scenario, is the infinite set of killers. And that since there cannot be an infinite number of Reapers, causal finitism is true. And I take it as fairly obvious that if causal finitism is true, in other words, if every state or event has a finite causal history, then it follows that there is a first cause. Now, here was where I laid down my first criticism. I highlighted that whilst Cameron acts as if causal finitism substantiates a singular first cause. The first cause, the first cause, the first cause, the first cause, the first cause. The author of causal finitism, Alexander Proofs, does not. Indeed, I provided several references of Proust clarifying that causal finitism would not substantiate a singular first cause, and urged Cameron to cease asserting that it does, as this is a disservice to Proust and his work. What's more, I emphasised that since causal finitism would not substantiate a singular first cause, Cameron needs either the Grim Reaper paradox in and of itself to substantiate a singular first cause, or he needs to provide additional arguments. In his reply, however, Cameron unfortunately sidestepped this criticism entirely by insisting that it is not an objection of his misuse of causal finitism, but rather it's an objection to his second premise. However, this is actually an objection to my second premise. And when he finally did touch upon this criticism, he misconstrued it. Alright, so let's pause a moment and go back to Stephen's earlier objection that he gave that perhaps the first cause is a plurality of infinitely many things. How do we know that we're talking about a single being as opposed to many different beings? Indeed, I provided references of the author clearly stating that causal finitism would not substantiate a singular first cause, and that consequently Cameron is misrepresenting it when he says, If causal finitism is true, then it follows that there is a first cause. And Cameron responded by giving an additional argument as to why we ought to assume a singular being over multiple beings. Thus, he did not address my objection, and so I'd like to plant the first big red flag here. This needs addressing. Okay, so let's get back to causal finitism as it's defined by Proust at least. 
In an attempt to still man the argument, to make it stronger, I gave three other ways in which the Grim Reaper paradox supports causal finitism. I explained that while Cameron assumes that the paradox demonstrates the impossibility of an infinite set of reapers, it could just as easily be argued that it demonstrates a lack of infinite space, that a segment of time is not infinitely divisible, or that information can only travel so fast. In any of these cases, causal finitism holds true. From here, I proceeded to offer three objections to the argument itself, and again for the sake of clarity, we'll witness the exchange of each in turn, beginning with my first. 1. The contradiction in the Grim Reaper paradox is predicated on a beginning, a starting point. But in order to apply the argument to the universe itself, Cameron must be assuming a starting point within an infinite past, which is not possible. There is no beginning in an infinite past, and without a beginning there is no paradox. Or as I put it moments later, the paradox requires us to select an arbitrary beginning and end, such as between 12am and 1am, and then to divide this segment an infinite number of times to produce the contradiction. But if we don't assume a beginning, that is, if we assume that the universe has an infinite past, then no contradiction is produced. And, uh, well, Here's how Cameron responded. All right, so I want to switch gears a little bit and introduce you to a new version of the Grim Reaper story, something that Dr. Rob Coons calls the Grim Messenger story. Yeah, that's right. He didn't just move the goalposts, he switched the goalposts entirely. In his opening, he presented the goalposts of the Grim Reaper paradox, and once I had taken a shot, once I had provided objections, he abandoned the goalposts for a new set, the Grim Messenger paradox. Cameron is careful to sell this as a mere updated version. Alright, so I want to switch gears a little bit. But make no mistake about it, it's a completely different argument. If it wasn't inspired by the Grim Reaper paradox, it wouldn't even have the word Grim in it. But do you know what? Whilst it would have been a display of good faith for Cameron to admit the defeat of the Grim Reaper paradox before switching to the Grim Messenger paradox, it's fine for him to sweep the former argument under the carpet. What's not fine, however, is what he did next. So now let's see how this new version of the paradox fares against Stephen's three primary objections. Yeah, he applied the objections I gave to his old argument to his new one, and then had the audacity to boast that my objections are insufficient. This new version of the paradox, the Grim Messenger paradox, obviously does apply to an infinite past and does imply a first cause. In light of all this, I think we ought to consider Stephen's attempted undercutting defeaters against the justification that I offered in defense of my first premise. I think we ought to consider all of those themselves defeated. His defeaters, in other words, have themselves been defeated. <laughs> Honestly, this is just outrageous. It's one of the most absurd things I've ever experienced in a debate. It's akin to Cameron asking me to critique the stability of his shed, only for him to reject my critiques as they do not apply to his house. It's really bizarre. But given that his flagship is now the Grim Messenger paradox, I'm happy to work with it. But I do have to say that if Cameron changes the goalposts again, then, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, my interest in this debate will wane. Such an act would demonstrate that he obviously doesn't have sound justification for his first premise, and is just throwing out paradoxes in the hope that one sticks. There's a time and a place for playing around with paradoxes, and in a debate in which you claim to have a sufficient argument for the existence of God is not it. Okay. Let's hear it. One of the primary differences between the Reaper story and the Messenger story is that instead of being split over an hour, the messengers are split over an infinite past. Grim Messenger number one is assigned to January 1st, 2020. Messenger number two is assigned to January 1st, 2019, and so on and so on further and further into the past. So instead of killing people, these messengers are tasked basically with passing on a message that they received from their predecessor. They pass that message to their successor. So here's the crucial setup for this story. If the message that they receive from their predecessor has no natural number written on it, then they'll go ahead and write their number. But on the other hand, if the message that they receive already has a number on it, then they do nothing, they don't write anything down, they just pass the message on to their successor. Okay, so now our question is, does this message have a natural number written on it? And the obvious answer here is yes. Suppose that no one wrote anything down until the year 2020. Well then, Grim Messenger number one would have written the number one on it. So there has to be some number written on this message. But here's the sort of paradoxical question that gets asked here, is what number is written on the message? The answer, again paradoxically, is that it can't have any natural number written on it. Suppose for a moment that the number written on this message is 1000. This is actually impossible because Grim Messenger number 1001 would have written 1001 on the paper if when he received it, it was blank. 
So Grim Messenger number 1000 would have received a paper that said 1001 and he would have just passed the message along. And this same process can be repeated for any Grim Messenger, any natural number. So it follows from this that no natural number can be written on the message. So just like in the Grim Reaper scenario, we have an explicit contradiction. The message has a natural number written on it and the message has no natural number written on it. So now let's see how this new version of the paradox fares against Stephen's three primary objections. Okay, so there's a huge issue from the outset, and that is that this is not a paradox. It's a functional impossibility. To say that each messenger has a unique number, as opposed to will have a unique number, a potential infinite must have elapsed. But the nature of a potential infinite entails that it can never elapse. It continues forever. Well, to put this another way, you can draw out a one-to-one -one correspondence between natural numbers, messengers, and years forever, as they are all potentially infinite. But to say that each messenger has a unique number before you draw out a correspondence necessitates that a potential infinite has already elapsed, and that's definitionally not possible. Now, over the last few days, I've been thinking of various ways to make the flaw more obvious, and my favourite so far is to simply flip the numbers assigned to the messengers from ascending to descending. Instead of this year's messenger being assigned number 1, last year's being assigned number 2, and so on, tell me the number assigned to this year's messenger given a potential infinite of assigned messengers before it. You can't. The very nature of a potential infinite prohibits this. Hence, today's reaper not only doesn't know its number, but can't know its number. So there's my first response. This scenario is not a paradox, it's a functional impossibility. But for my second response, note that even if this paradox was functional, it's begging the question, since it assumes a first state, the initial condition of a blank message, in order to prove that there must have been a first state. This isn't so easy to recognise due to the way in which the scenario is presented, but I'd wager that if the scenario was presented in a syllogism, it would be opaque. Talking of which, if Cameron wishes to proceed with the Grim Messenger scenario, I'd like to request that he provide a syllogistic form. Alright, so we're done with the first premise, and now we're going to move on to the second. If I may say, this is a perfect time to pause, grab a few biscuits, and brew a fresh cuppa. Okay, so let's move on to the second premise of my argument. For reference, it says that if there is a first cause, then God exists. Cameron began by correctly stating that we have no concrete examples of something that's uncaused. Absolutely nothing, like no object at all in our experience is uncaused. But he then proceeded to confidently assert what properties uncaused things necessarily have. The relevant difference between the caused and the uncaused is limits. And he got to this conclusion by asserting that since all limited things have causes, limits or things that possess limits have causes. It somehow follows that all unlimited things don't have causes. Alternatively, let's think about something that has no limits. In response, I noted that this is a non sequitur, that even if it were the case that all limited things have causes, it would not follow that all unlimited things don't have causes. That this is akin to asserting that since all oceans have water, it therefore follows that all non-oceans don't have water. It could be the case that both limited and unlimited things have causes. And in his rebuttal, Cameron was so kind as to offer three responses. Alright, so I'm going to make three responses to this. But before we address these, I'd like to touch upon the argument from limits that Cameron presented later in his rebuttal. From this premise, it follows that if the first cause is limited, then it has a cause. However, as I argued, the first cause is by definition uncaused. Otherwise, it's not a first cause. And thus, it follows that the first cause has no limits. My argument from limits is a valid deductive argument. Calling it a non sequitur, as Stephen did here, is actually not an option. Moving right along. Cameron is of course correct to state that his argument from limits is valid, but if you go through the entirety of his opening, you'll notice that this syllogism is nowhere to be found. Indeed, it didn't exist in his opening. It didn't exist until his rebuttal. If this syllogism did exist in his opening, then I would have used it as opposed to having to conjure one out of his hiking story. Hence, I didn't call his argument from limits a non sequitur, as Stephen did here, as it didn't exist for me to call it anything. Rather, I called the reasoning he buried in his hiking story a non sequitur. Now, with this new syllogism on the table, my charge of a non sequitur is dissolved, and so the next question is, is this syllogism sound? What sound justification does Cameron offer to confidently assert that uncaused things, of which we have no examples, are unlimited? 
Well, strangely enough, the two primary responses he gave to my charge of a non sequitur actually had nothing to do with validity and everything to do with soundness. And due to this, we can analyze his reasoning now. First, I don't see any reason at all to think that reasonable conclusions require concrete examples. We have no concrete examples of a 200-sided dice. Nevertheless, I think we can draw a reasonable conclusion that if we were to roll the dice, the probability of it landing on, say, 78, assuming the dice is fair, is 1 out of 200. Reasonable conclusions don't require concrete examples. Agreed. We don't need concrete examples of something to reasonably conclude that it can occur. But we do need sufficient knowledge to base our inference from. In the case of a 200-sided die, we can make a reasonable inference without having a concrete example because, crucially, we have sufficient knowledge of how physics affects die with less and more sides. What's more, baked into the very definition of a fair die, assuming the dice is fair, is that each side has an equal probability of turning up. It's analytically true. It's true by definition. Each face of a fair billion-sided die necessarily has the same chance of turning up in virtue of it being fair. But on the contrary, we have no examples whatsoever of anything that's uncaused. Not one. Zero. Zilch. Thus, this is akin to having no examples of any dice or any knowledge of how falling objects are affected by physics, and hence to act as if uncaused things and non-existent dice are analogous in this crucial way is to engage in a false analogy fallacy. Whilst they both share the quality, or lack thereof, of us not having any examples, they do not share the qualities that enable us to make reasonable inferences. Indeed, the uncaused hasn't been demonstrated to exist at all, let alone that it has any properties. Second, I offered limits as a relevant difference between the caused and the uncaused, and this is really important, as a proposal. I wanted Steven and everybody watching to really think hard about the problem for yourself. If I'm honest, this strikes me as a cop-out, a dodge. In his opening, Cameron confidently stated numerous times that the difference between the caused and the uncaused is limits. The relevant difference between the caused and the uncaused is limits. But if he now wants to call this a mere proposal, then sure, I don't mind. But note that whatever he calls it, he needs it to hold true for his argument to be sound. After all, if uncaused things are, like caused things, limited, then that doesn't gel so well with something that's perfect does it? Let alone a perfect morally good being. I wanted Steven and everybody watching to really think hard about the problem for yourself. And I have to say, if Cameron wants me, or you, the viewer, to create his arguments for him, then he's rendered himself redundant. He is the one claiming to have a sound argument for the existence of a god. He is the one asserting that uncaused things exist. He is the one who's asserting that uncaused things are unlimited. The burden of proof is on him. Cameron needs to provide a sound justification for his assertion that uncaused things are unlimited, and for him to state that his claim was just a mere proposal, proposal is at best an act of him conceding that he does not have a sound justification. Thus, likewise to his primary argument, Cameron's argument from limits is valid, but he hasn't demonstrated it to be sound. But now that we're back on the topic of validity, I'd like to reiterate much of what I did in my opening. To illustrate this, consider the following valid argument. Premise 1. I'm making this video. Premise 2. If I'm making this video, then Cameron doesn't exist. Conclusion. Therefore, Cameron doesn't exist. Now make no mistake about it, this argument is valid, it just isn't sound. Following this example, let's take Cameron's argument from limits and replace the word limited with good and not limited with not good. We now have a valid argument which states that the uncaused must not be good, aka evil. This is a valid argument. Or, and here's my favourite, let's switch out the words for existent and non-existent. Now we have a valid argument that states that the uncaused does not exist. I could now pull all the same moves as Cameron by saying, hey, look, absolutely nothing, like no object at all in our experience is non-existent. Absolutely nothing, like no object at all in our experience is uncaused. And first, the issue is, still, soundness. Cameron needs a sound argument for this premise, and until he provides one, his argument is, like Fred, dead. Okay. With that, there is now plenty on the table for Cameron to respond to, and whilst I could go on to address every defence and new argument he gave in favour of his subsequent premises, you'll be pleased to hear that he and I have agreed that in the interest of productivity, and quite frankly your sanity, we'll keep our responses within a digestible timescale. But know that if, for whatever reason, we do not get round to Cameron's subsequent premises, I will address them in an unrelated video in the future. Because, well, I've already written the script.
Now, before we recap, there were 14 misrepresentations and comments throughout Cameron's rebuttal that I'd like to address, but considering how much time that would take, I've decided on just one that I simply can't let slide, and it's an absolute whopper of a straw man. An important difference that arises between Stephen and I in this section is that Stephen identifies as an empiricist. So let's watch what he has to say here. As an empiricist, I would say that to concretely know something, we must verify it through the scientific method. Now, since Stephen is actually referencing the scientific method, I think it's more accurate to call this view scientism as opposed to empiricism. There are many, many problems with scientism outlined in the literature, but I'm just gonna list two really quickly. First, if Stephen is right, when I first watched this segment, my jaw literally dropped. I have seldom seen such a gargantuan straw man. Thus, as a proponent of scientism, Stephen doesn't actually know. I express that I'm an empiricist, that I'm convinced that the best pathway to knowledge is through the scientific method. And Cameron took the word scientific method and leaped to scientism, the notion that only science can be used to reach epistemological values. And then to top it all off, Cameron had Joe Smith provide a series of objections to scientism. A second, probably more serious problem for scientism is that it's self-defeating. Consider the following argument from agnostic philosopher Joe Schmid. According to scientism, science is the sole reliable guide to reality. All right, so let's get back on track here. Let's get away from Stephen self-defeating scientism. <laughs> This insane leap to scientism and subsequent tangent suggests that Cameron doesn't understand the scientific method, of which empirical observation is the cornerstone. And that's all I was saying, that I want empirical, that is to say observational, evidence of something uncaused before we confidently assert what attributes uncaused things necessarily have. That isn't a tall order. Like I said, there are plenty more fires that could do with being extinguished, but I don't want to waste your time by stepping away from the argument. And so, let's recap. As an unfortunate necessity, I began by replying to Cameron's dissatisfaction of me not providing argumentation against his premises, which is formerly known as a rebutting defeater. I emphasised that the burden of proof is on him and that my exposing his justifications as insufficient, which is formerly known as an undercutting defeater, is more than adequate. From here, I reiterated my criticism of Cameron misusing Alexander Proust's causal finitism. Throughout his work, Proust has consistently been clear on the fact that causal finitism does not necessitate a singular uncaused cause, and yet Cameron has consistently acted as if it does. Cameron unfortunately deflected this criticism by applying it to monotheism over polytheism. In the next segment, the fact that the Grim Reaper paradox is a completely different argument to the Grim Messenger paradox was made clear. I stated that I'm happy for Cameron to discard the former, but that if he does this again, my interest will wane. We then watched Cameron discard many of my criticisms of the Grim Reaper paradox since, understandably, they do not apply to the Grim Messenger paradox, and in return I explained that this is nonsensical. I then provided two responses to the Grim Messenger paradox, with the first being that it's functionally impossible, and the second being that even if it was functional, it's begging the question. In the next segment, we focused on Cameron's ninth premise. I remarked that whilst his newly introduced syllogism is valid, he has not demonstrated it to be sound. I emphasised that his first justification is a false analogy fallacy, and that his second justification is a cop-out. Anyhow, as always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and those of you who have supported the channel via other means. I sincerely appreciate it.